I can't change my feelings, but I can change my thinking. If I change my thinking, that will change my feelings and then that'll change what I do. So I'm, I'm supposed to be renewing our mind. So I have to sometimes be very specific and build a godly stronghold in the opposite spirit. When I, I shared yesterday how I got, uh, I got my, my own personal deliverance in 1982, and I was just, uh, I mean, yeah, in 81, and I was so glad to be, you know, to have my own freedom. Never really cared to minister. I was learning about it. I moved to Washington State in, in uh, 82, near, near Seattle. And by this time, my, my wife and I were, you know, learning about this together. I, I was finally sharing with her some of the things that had happened to me, and, and we're just learning about this. And I, I didn't really care to do it. I was just happy with my own. In fact, I didn't want to do it. I, ne <laughs> I never like seen a deliverance session. I didn't know how it was supposed to go. And uh, in the summer of 1982, my wife went to lunch with one of the young ladies in our church, precious young mom. And I uh, went to lunch with her, and, and, uh, and at lunch, the, the woman shared with my wife an area in her life that she struggled with, an area that she just did not have any control in. And uh, my wife asked her, she said, do you, do you think it, you think it might be demonic? She says, I, I don't know. What do you think? She goes, I don't know. Why don't you come over to the house tonight and let Rodney minister to you? <laughs> My wife comes home, tells me about her lunch. She tells me, that she, you know, all the stuff she was struggling with, you know, which she doesn't always do, you know. You know, sometimes, you know, we don't talk about what other people have, but she felt like she needed to tell me. And, I was, and she said, you know, and I think it could be demonic. And I said, you know, I, I, you're, you're right. It sounds like it could be demonic. She says, yeah. So, so I invited her over here tonight for you to minister to her. I said, you did What? She said, yeah, I invited her over here tonight so you can minister to her. I said, why did you do that? I mean, I've never done one of these things before. I don't know how to do this. Why did you do that? She said, well, after all, you, you are her pastor. <laughs> so, so she pulled the pastor card out. So now I go, yeah, okay, I, I don't know what to do. You know, so I call, I call my dad. <laughs> my dad's pastoring in Tulsa, Oklahoma, very large church in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I call him up and I say, Dad, you got to help me. I got a woman. She's coming over tonight. I think she's got demons. I don't know what to do. Can, can you help me out? He said, well, don't ask me. <laughs> he said, but... I have a guy who is here ministering in our church this week. His name is Jim Hilton, and he's been casting demons left and right out of people. He said, mostly out of our leadership. <clears throat> but he happens to be here right now, and I put him on the phone. I said, Jehovah Jireh. I mean, I'm saved, and so... So I, I said, let me get a tape recorder. I want to record this. I get my recorder. By the way, later on, the recorder was absolutely blank. But I think that was probably God that did that one. I said, okay, oh man. You know, so I, anyway, I got on the phone and I'm listening, you know, not paying too much attention because I got a tape recorder. 
I'm just going to play that over and over again. There's nothing to, to, you know, after it's over. So now I'm going. So I prayed the, all afternoon, the Lord help me prayer. That's all, those are the only words. Help me. Help me, Jesus. Help me. I don't know what I'm doing. <clears throat> she comes on. Well, she comes over. And, uh, you know, just a young lady, and she's just, you know, very precious. You know, you didn't, wouldn't think there was anything there. And uh, she comes in and, and sits down, and we chit-chat a little bit. And then I'm thinking, okay, I don't know how to start this. So I think, I'll just read the Bible. I'm just, I picked out a few passages that I thought would, like, harass them. <laughs> you know, maybe stir them up a little bit. So I read, I read those verses, and, and she looked at me, and she goes, those are nice. And I'm thinking, okay, this is not working. So I said, well, let's pray. So we all bowed our head, closed our eyes to pray, which, by the way, rule number one, do not close your eyes. But nobody told me the rule, so I didn't know. So I closed my eyes. <clears throat> we all did. I prayed. Get through praying. I'm looking up, looking at my wife, and and she's going. She goes, I can't open my eyes. I said, What do you mean you can't open her eyes? She goes, I can't open my eyes. And I look at my wife and I give her the look. The look of what did you get us into? In the name of Jesus, I command those eyes to open. And then, boom. I go, oh, it worked. <laughs> and I'm starting to talk, and she says, this isn't funny. I, I, I see your lips moving, but I can't hear a thing. I go, oh, no. I turn and give my wife the, the look. In the name of Jesus, I command those ears to open. And boom, they opened up. And for the next several hours, it was the worst experience of my life. <laughs> oh man, I had no idea what I was doing. I mean, if those demons can smell fear, they were smelling me. I mean, I was... It was, I was scared. It was freaky. But, you know, at the end of the night, they left. You know, at least all the ones we found, they left. And I don't know if they left because we drove them out or because we wore them out. <laughs> but at the end of the night, they were gone. And what I saw on her face was the face of freedom. And I said, Jesus, I do not like this experience. But I'll go through it to see that face. Once I got started in that process, I, I, you know, I wanted to stop. You know, it's kind of like, but you can't. I mean, you're committed. So now, it's kind of like a woman going into labor. You just can't say, okay, today's not a good day. <laughs> Next Tuesday is much better. And, and the whole time I was dreading, why are we doing this? Why did I say yes? But at the end of the night, when I saw the face, I go, okay. I hate this experience, but I'll do it for you. We're going to talk, I don't, I don't know what chapter it is. It's in your book. When, but we're going to talk about the basics of deliverance. I think it's like chapter 10 or something like that. And then we're going to spend the, the next hour talking about how to get rid of them. Breaking free, how to, how to, how to get set free of those things. So, but we're going to kind of lay a little bit of a foundation. 
and a little bit of a biblical foundation for, for ministering this area. And the first thing that we need to take note of is that not, it's, everything's not the same. In other words, there are varying, various levels of impact that dem demons have with people. I mean, when I was in college, I went and saw the movie, The Exorcist. I do not recommend seeing that or the remake or anything like that. I was a bunch of college guys. We went and, we, and then we wished we hadn't. But you know, that, cat, that gal in there is kind of like the Gerizines, you know. You know, the guy at the Gatherings there, Gerizines, Gatherings, depending on what translation. They were like on a 10, on a one to 10 scale. And my presumption was, you know, if you got demons, you're at that, you're at that level. And I really wasn't paying attention to all the other levels that weren't quite that bad, where people actually lived normal lives. They just had one or two areas of, of influence and impact. So that, we put that guy in number 10. Uh, Peter was impacted by the enemy which was not, he, there was no demonic attachment, but there was demonic influence. You know, this is, this is the passage in Mark chapter eight. Mark chapter eight, 31 through 33. Jesus just got through telling the disciples all about what's gonna happen to him. And then what happened? Well, then uh, Peter rebuked Jesus. It's never a good idea to rebuke Jesus. <laughs> I wouldn't recommend rebuking God at any time, but, but he did. And then, and then Jesus said to him, get behind me, Satan. He, he's talking to Peter, but he said, get behind me, Satan. Who's he talking to? He's talking to the thoughts that Peter had. The origin of those thoughts were not Peter. They, they, were, they were demonically influenced. You see, the enemy put thoughts in Peter's head that Peter took and embraced as his own thoughts. You see, the enemy can put thoughts into your head. We usually call this temptation. He can put thoughts in, into your head that sound like you and you embrace them as your thoughts, but they're not your thoughts. And so Jesus was addressing the source of those thoughts. Now understand this, even though they can put thoughts in your head, they cannot read your thoughts. That's a God thing. First Corinthians 2, only the person under, who, who knows the thoughts of a man except for that man. They can't read your thoughts. They can know the thoughts they put in your head. They probably feel some of the emotions that you are projecting but they can't read your thoughts. And most of the time, they guess. When I'm ministering, they have no idea what's going on in my head. They have no understanding of my conversations that I'm having with God. And they guess. One time a demon was leaving a woman, and as it was leaving, this demon threatened, he threatened, this demon threatened my family. He threatened my little girl. He just told me all the things that, that they're going to do to my little girl as it left. Only problem is, I only have three sons. <laughs> they, they guess. But if I had a daughter, they would... You know, I, I, if I entertained that, if I came into an agreement with it, then I would empower that. So you got to hold people. So you got, you know, you got the person who's at a 10. You got, you know, Peter who's just influenced, you know, in his thought life. That's like a three. You know, you got the other people. You got the boy who was physically tormented in Luke 9. You know, he's not as bad because the father said it scarcely left him, but that means he had some moments of, si of, of sanity. Uh, you have the mute man. That's only one area of his life in Luke eleven fourteen, Blind and mute, that's two areas. You have the lady in Luke 13, 11, 
who was crippled over for 18 years that was caused by a demon. But you need to understand, she's probably living a pretty normal life. You know, she's fixing dinner and all that kind of stuff. She just can't, she just can't stand up straight. See, what we see is that there are various levels that enemy impacts people. My wife and I were driving home one night when we were living in California. So we're driving home one night and we noticed at, at our neighbor's house down the street, we didn't know them, were all these emergency vehicles. I mean, everything from this, everything locally, everything nationally was at this person's house because they had a meth lab in their garage. It was a drug house. But even though we had one drug house in the neighborhood, doesn't, did not make my neighborhood a drug neighborhood. My neighborhood was a great neighborhood because we lived in that neighborhood. But you see, the enemy, this is what he does. He goes in for one place of real estate one place, an open door, an unoccupied area. He goes in and tries to, to occupy one house on the block. And from there, he sets up a base of operation to occupy or to influence the other houses in the neighborhood. That's kind of how they work. They look for the inroad that is there. Now, one of the issues that oftentimes that we face as believers is how is it that we find demons with believers? Which I'm going to address that issue. One of the problems is a misinterpretation of the Greek language that is often translated or You'll, you'll read it as somebody is demon-possessed. The word demon-possessed is an inaccurate translation. It's used two ways in the Greek. First, you have the person who's the subject. The person has, has, and that is the Greek word echo, has a demon, a person has a demon. That word has is the same word, that word echo is the same word that John the Baptist had a camel hair coat. Mary had a baby, she was with child. Uh, uh, A person has a sickness or a person has an offense. The person has the demon and it's the word daemon or daemonion or in other places, an unclean spirit. So a person has that. Not a demon has a person. The camel hair coat did not have John the Baptist. John the Baptist had the camel hair coat. Okay, we got that one? The other thing, the other way it's used is that there is a verb. It is the the verb demoniosomai. And so this actually is better translated demonized, demon-influenced, demon-oppressed, because that word demonizomai, that verb, is a generic term. It's, it, it, it could be the guy at the Gadarenes. It could be that one who totally lost it, who's totally possessed, owned by the enemy. Or it could be talking about just the influence. It could be somebody on a one scale like Peter. In other words, there's a demonic influence there. The Geneva Bible, which is probably one of the earlier English Bibles written in the 1500s, translates the person has a demon correctly. They don't say, you know, they're possessed, but that verb, they translate as demon possession. And oftentimes when one translation 
It happens. People borrow from it as they're making other ones, like the King James and, and other ones there. So I'm just trying to tell you, that in, in the Greek language, it's, it doesn't say demon-possessed. So a Christian, because a Christian is possessed by God and can never be possessed by a demon. So you cannot be owned by a demon. However, you can be influenced, impact, oppressed. They just don't stop their activity just because you gave your life to Jesus. And if you want to know really all about those words and uh, things like that, and you, you like to have a resource, I think there is a resource at the table out there that you can probably find that may have that stuff all detailed. I'm pretty sure. But you see, the enemy base, right, resides where they find a place of darkness. So when a person comes into a relationship with Jesus, we become that new creature, that new creation. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely. May your spirit, soul, and body be preserved, complete at his coming. So the Bible talks about us being this body, soul, and this spirit. You know, in, in, in like these three parts, just kind of like the, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit and the temple has three parts, the outer court, the inner court, and then the inner, inner court, the holiest of holies. You see that inner, inner, inner part of you is the spirit. You have a spirit, born with a spirit. You are a spirit person. You were born this way. When the Bible talks about us being spiritually dead, it didn't mean that you didn't have a spirit. It just simply means that your spirit was cut off from its life source. So it, 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 it didn't, that's why it's spiritually dead because it didn't have, it wasn't connected to its life source. When you receive Jesus, God's spirit comes inside your spirit. You become a new creature, a new creation. That's a very holy place. And I don't think any demon can, can touch at all your spirit because I think that's where the Holy Spirit is and that's a very holy place. And see what is happening is that God starts from the inside and then he's, he's sanctifying everything from the inside out. Everything that you have is all in your soul has already been bought and paid for by the blood of Jesus. So what's inside of you is supposed to be emanating to every part of you. You see, your, your soul, your mind, your will, and emotions, you know, he has your mind. In fact, 1 Corinthians 2 says that you have the mind of Christ. You know, your will, I mean, I think it's Philippians 2, 13, it, it is God in you, both the will and the work for his good pleasure. The fruit of the Spirit, with your emotions, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. I mean, all of that has already been bought and paid for, and all of that is your rightful inheritance that you should push in to walk, to walk in. Your body? I mean, this body is going to die because of sin, but it's already been bought and paid for because we get a new one. Isn't that good? We get to exchange. This one's because of sin. It, it's going to die, but man, we're going to get a glorified, resurrected body. Now, having said that, I, I do believe that it is our right to push in for divine health. That's what I've been pushing in for this weekend. I've been fighting for it, right? I think it's our right to do that. I mean, you know, sickness was not a part of the curse. I mean, it wasn't there. It's not, we don't have to, we don't have to settle for that. And, you know, and, and it's like this, if I could find it in the Bible, then I can believe it. And I found, I found in the Old Testament, this guy named Caleb. He said, I'm 85 and I'm just as strong at 85 as I was when I was 40. Come on, Jesus, the Caleb anointing. I mean, if I can find it, I can push in for it. I was in India one time, and, and you know, we, we, as we're praying, this old guy came in. I mean, he was old. He's everything bent over. I said, how can I pray for you? 
He said, everything hurts. I'm going, okay, what? All right. Why couldn't you just like give me a headache or something like that? But everything hurts. So when I prayed for him, I, that thought about the Caleb thing. Lord, I just declare the Caleb anointing on this man, that he will be as strong at this age as he was when he was young. And you know, God did that for him. The next lady came up, could have been his mother. She asked for the same thing. I prayed the same thing, and God did the same thing. So, not only do I have the testimony of the word, but I have the testimony of what he did for me to step into. You should, what the, I'm just saying. I'm saying we should just, that's what we should be doing there. So what is happening is that once we give our heart to Jesus, then we are, we're pushing in to who we are. We're taking off who we're not and putting on who we are. So uh, Ephesians chapter four, you know, 22 through 24 says that we lay aside the old self. We're laying aside who we're not. It's, it's like old clothes, I'm taking it off. Then it says to be renewed in the spirit of our mind and then to put on who we are, the new self, which is in the righteousness and holiness of the truth. So in our new self, we are righteous. In our new self, we are holy. And in our new self, you know, I mean, by the way, that, that, that holiness, that word holiness is not the average word for holy. I mean, the, the, the normal word for holy is the word hagios, set apart. But this particular word for holy, holiness, is it, the word, that particular Greek word means free from contamination. That's because you're intertwined with Jesus who is free from contamination. So we're going through a process of removing who we aren't and putting on who we are. So what we so for the believer, deliverance is a process of removing who we're not, letting Jesus be king over every area of our life and putting on who we are. And sometimes as we just put on who we are, the, the, all who we aren't slides off. So salvation is used in the Greek language in the past, present, and future tense. I was saved, I'm being saved, and I will be saved. The word sanctification is also past, present, and future. You were sanctified when you gave your heart to Jesus. You're in this process of sanctification, setting aside who you're not, and then the day that it will be fully clothed. You say, that's, that's in the Word? Yeah. Well, where is it? Well, I don't have time to go through it, but I do have a source <laughs> if you needed to read about it and uh, look those things up. I'm just saying. Paul talked to the guys at Galatians, and this is what he said in Galatians 4.19. He, he, he said, I labor until Christ is formed in you. You see, Jesus can be in you, but is he formed in you yet? Ephesians you know, 4 would tell us that we are to come into the fullness of the stature that we find in Jesus. We, we already have him in us, but the Jesus within us now needs to be formed in us. So we usually call this process maturity, growing up, taking off who you're not, putting on who you are. The people of Israel go into the land of promise. The land belonged to them. It was their Land. They had ownership. It was their possession, but they didn't possess their possession yet. So what they had to do? They had to go possess their possession. 
They had to go attack strongholds. They had to remove. This is a picture of sanctification. They went in and began to claim what already belonged to them. And God was with them to do that. See, this, this, is what, this is what we're doing. We're learning to possess our, our possession or what Jesus, his, his possession. When my wife bought our house in California, uh, we bought it in this neighborhood. It's a nice neighborhood. It was on the side of a hill. Uh, you know, we, the garage was underneath the, the house and then we had this there's, you know, a lot of hill back behind us and very, very beautiful house. You know, I had a view we can see and everything. God was just so good to provide us for that. So we bought this house and uh, we move into it. And right behind the garage, under the house, it's kind of a storage area. And so when we moved in, we realized the previous owners left some stuff. I oh, know. So what do you think we did with it? Did we say, oh, well, it's been here for so long. Maybe we should save it for them. No, it went into the dumpster. If they came back five, five or six weeks later, oh, we forgot some stuff. Too bad, so sad. It is gone. That is our house. And so we, we, we possess the whole house. They even left stuff in the attic. We toss that too. And you see, when Jesus comes into our life, our house is under new ownership. We, t we belong to him. But you know, we might have a closet or two that we're hanging on to. Maybe something that's in the dark. Something you've not let go of. And Jesus wants access to the closet. There's, there's a couple of other, uh, you know, people always kind of bring it up to me. You know, they say, well, yeah, but, you know, Christians and demons, how about, doesn't the Bible say, what does light have to do with darkness? And usually I'll ask the person, can you quote me that passage? which they usually can't tell me where that's found. Because if they did, then they would probably should know the context. Do you know context is pretty important? Well, that's found in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And that, and that thought starts off by saying, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what fellowship does light have with darkness or Christ with Belial, or which is a word for like the devil? You see, that is actually a warning against believers because they were doing that. It's not saying that, 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 that it couldn't happen because it was happening. He was warning them, don't do this because you may be opening yourself up. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I was for First Corinthians chapter ten, you'll have this right around verse twenty one or something or twenty two. I don't know. It, it says, you know, you can't drink of the cup of the Lord and drink of the cup of demons. What's the context? Idol worship, because they were doing it. They're going to church on Sunday, going to the temple on Monday. He says, guys, don't do this. So he can't say that you can't. He said, it's, it's like, don't. Don't do this. These aren't supposed to be mixing. He's laying down the law here, guys. You are opening yourself up to demonic influence and bondage. And if you want a little bit of further explanation of, about those passages, I do know of a resource that might spend a little more time explaining some of that stuff. So, 
So how does a, a person, a believer, get a demon attached to them? Well, in the book of Ephesians chapter 4, 26 and 27, it says, in your anger, do not sin. Do not let the, do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil an opportunity, a place, a foothold. The King James uses the word place. The, the NIV, foothold. Uh, the Revised Standard said, don't make room for the devil. That word is actually a very generic word. It's the Greek word tapos, and it actually means anything from something small to actually just a large piece of property. Uh, a further definition of that, you know, of that word is explained in another resource that I could recommend to you. But it's really, he's talking to Christians here, okay? He says, Christian, do not give the devil a place. Do not really open the door and let him have a foothold. <clears throat> and he's talking to Christians here. The best way I can describe it is using a piton as an illustration. Now, if a lot of people from Colorado know what pitons are. If you're not... Well, if you don't do mountain climbing, you probably never heard of one. I don't know if you can see it. Well, that didn't help. <laughs> but a piton is an instrument that mountain climbers use as they go up and down the mountain. What they do is they got to attach themselves to, you know, into the side of the mountain. And so what they do, they look for a crack. And when they find a crack, they get their hammer and they wedge this thing into the crack. They can't drive it into solid rock. You just, it doesn't do that. You have to find a crack. You get a crack, drive into the crack, and then they attach their D-ring to it and then suspend themselves on the side of the cliff. So that's what the enemy does. He looks for your cracks. He can't go into anything solid, so he looks for your vulnerabilities, your weaknesses. He looks for your, your hurts, your wounds, your pain. He looks for the areas that give him an open door and opportunity. He looks for areas that you have neglected, areas you haven't filled your life up with Jesus or brought into the Lordship of Jesus. He's looking for an opportunity to wedge himself in. How do you get rid of them? Well, why don't you just heal the crack? I mean, address the reason why they got in there in the first place. I was able to put this in some luggage. You know, the TSA do not like this when I bring this. I always get stopped. Like, what is that? Is that a lethal weapon? Like, well, it's not sharp. So I, I don't always get to bring that. Hallelujah, I was able to. So they get, they get in to the door either by your choice. You chose to, 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 lead, to, to let them in. Or it could be that it's an area that's uninhabited, that's hidden, that's neglected. You know, like for me, it was a place in the darkness. It was a place I was ashamed of. It was a place I was like, I, I wasn't bringing it into the light. It was a place that I really couldn't control. It was an area of, of habitual sin and I couldn't find any freedom in it. And when I got set free, all of that left. Sometimes, you know, those, sometimes those, those demons have no right at all. They're just, they're trespassers. They're squatters. They're squatters. They're intruders. Sometimes they're looking for those legal loopholes of how they can get in. They're, they're legalists. 
And so if they can find a legal loophole, you know, in a legal system, they're going to claim they have a right. So what are some of these common opportunities? What, what are they? Well, in your notes, you have a whole list there. It's not an exhaustive list, but let me just cover a few of those. Obviously, habitual sin is the first one. It's not just sinning once. It's like you sin once and you sin again. You keep sinning and sinning and sinning. And you get to a place to where you can no longer control it, but it controls you. There's a demon involved. It's a place where it's like, I don't, I, I'm, I'm going to do it. I don't want to do it, but I know I'm going to do it. And then you do it and you feel so stupid for doing it. It's usually if there's a demon that's involved with that. Sexual perversion, uh, pornography. I mean, that, that opens the door, door to it. The occult, when you're actually calling on demons, worshiping demons, witchcraft. I mean, when you give your heart to Jesus, you have no right to talk to any other spirit except for the Holy Spirit. It is absolutely illegal. He's the only one. Can't, don't call on any other spirits, okay? Only the Holy Spirit. It could be a cult. A cult is that you're worshiping like a, a false Jesus or another Jesus or a no Jesus. Or they say Jesus is something that other than who he is. Like he's just a prophet. He's not the Messiah. Or sometimes it'll just be a multiple Jesuses. Like, like, you know, like Hinduism or something like that. They'll have all kinds of other gods that they're worshiping in. And sometimes it's the person doing, or even you were in the family that did that, that may open up the door. Drugs. And when I say drugs, I'm not talking about taking something that your body needs. Okay, I'm talking about taking something your body does not need. To try to find an effect, to get an effect. That will open the door. So, you know, but not, not, I mean, if you're taking your blood pressure medicine, I don't think you're going to get a demon from doing that, okay? Don't freak out. You go, oh no, I took an aspirin this morning, you know? Okay, this, if your body needs it, okay? Ancestral or generational sin. Uh, the enemy has really no right uh, for this for the believer. Ezekiel 18, we'll talk about it. it's not fair. One generation suffer from another generation. But you have to understand this about the generate. God, God designed the generations to be an avenue, a highway of blessing. One generation will bless. I mean, it'll, it'll just flow from generation to generation. God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God does not mean for us to walk in single generational anointings. Aaron was he, was, he was anointed as the high priest, had the high priestly garb on. His sons had priestly garbs, but not his. He's anointed. Oil flows down his face, off of his beard, flows into the, that high priestly robe. Now that high priestly robe has the fragrance of Aaron's anointing. He dies. Eliezer gets it. Eliezer's anointed. It flows down. And now Eliezer's robe contains his anointing and his father's anointing in it. He dies. Phineas gets it. He's anointed. It flows down on him. Now that robe contains the fragrance of Phineas' anointing and his father's and his grandfather's. You see, the blessings of God flow for a thousand generations. We're to be walking in multiple generational anointings because there is a generational highway. But you also find a passage in, in uh, Leviticus and then I think in your notes, maybe uh, Exodus 25. Uh, the other passage is found in the break free when we talk about generational things. You know, the gen Exodus, the 20th passage there, that one is in the context of the of the Ten Commandments where he says that the sins of the fathers pass down to the third and the fourth generation. And the enemy looks at that and he goes, I got, I got a loophole. 
But here's the good news. God, by the way, God does honor a covenant that's not his until a greater covenant supersedes it and breaks it. And you have, you have a blood covenant with Jesus that supersedes and annuls any previous covenant that was made in your half, in your behalf by any succeeding generation, preceding generation. You do. So anything up there, your family line is now, it, it's illegal. But sometimes we have to enforce. It is, is automatic. We enforce it. I mean, we're the, we, we wear the sheriff badge and we're going to enforce it. Okay? The power of words. Words have substance. They have assignments. There's life and death in the power of the tongue. The enemy has no power on you, but over you. But if you come to an agreement with a word that is spoken over you or a word that you speak over yourself, he will take advantage of that. If judgments have been coming out and that's been coming back, that's Luke chapter six. So anyway, you have to, we have the right to break off any curse of words, okay? Trauma. Thank God for Dr. Mike and what he does with trauma. The enemy likes to take advantage of weakened people. So uh, his stuff's out in the bookstore too, if you haven't bought that. Involuntary exposure to evil. I mean, you didn't, you didn't mean to get exposed, but you got exposed and the enemy took advantage of it. A lady... When I, the first church I pastored in Washington State, there was a family that was there. Uh, he was in the Navy. He was on a sub. <clears throat> he's, he's out for like 60 days, 45 to 60 days. So he's, going, he's getting ready to be deployed. He's not a Christian. His wife is, but he's, he wasn't a believer yet. He got saved later. They have a four-year-old son. This is back in the 80s, early 80s. He's going to spend some father-son time with his son, so he decided to rent a movie. So he rented the movie Poltergeist. <laughs> he was an unbeliever, didn't know any difference. He goes off to sea. Now this kid will not sleep at night. He wants the light on. He wants to sleep with his mom. Every night's a fight. She said, I knew something was wrong because I'm driving down the road and I'm just worshiping. And he says to me, he says, Mama, don't sing about Jesus. Don't sing about Jesus. She goes, oh, what's up with that? And uh, well, it all came to head one night. He's putting him down to bed and he's, he's not going down. He's not going down at all. He's every night, you know, leave the lights on. Can I sleep with you? Leave the lights on. He's whining, crying for a long time. And she said, all of a sudden, he got quiet. He says, Mama, the light's on. Mama, I can't see. He'd gone blind. Well, I'm, hell does not understand the fury of a mama whenever you mess with her baby, Right? She could have got that thing out in the flesh. <laughs> Just took about a moment. And he was fine after that. Now, having said that, let me just say this. When we're ministering to young children, parents, you have authority over those little children. Minister to them in their sleep. Because if you don't, it'll go like this. Now, I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to that thing that makes you do those things that you're not supposed to do. And then you start screaming at the kids, come out in Jesus' name. Okay, well, you know, don't. Don't traumatize your kids. And as that thing's leaving, he's whispering like something's wrong with you. 
So minister to your children in the sleep. If they're not leaving, ask the Holy Spirit. How did it get in? Ask the Holy Spirit, what do I do? Now, if your child is 35, it's not going to work. If they've grown up and they're participating, they need to participate in getting rid of it. So, by the way, grandparents, parents are the first line of authority. You're not. So, you can give it a shot, but I'm telling you, it's going to be depending on the parents. Well, what if their parents aren't walking with Jesus? Well, as a grandparent, you probably can teach that kid to fight. I mean, children do not receive a junior Holy Spirit. The way you get them out is that, you, you, know, you know, you start about, we, we just, sometimes I'm just going to use the authority that we have in Christ just to tell things to leave. And that's usually how I start off with. I don't presume anything has a right to be there. But once we, if it's not leaving, that's when we got to step back and say, is there an open door that needs to be closed? Is there a legal right that needs to be shut? Because otherwise, if that door remains open, things like to come back. Which leads us to the next thing, that once something leaves, we really should fill the house up. I mean, we don't want to leave it empty. I mean, isn't that what, you know, Matthew 12, 43 through 45 says, you know, it, it says, you know, when an unclean spirit leaves a person, it goes to the dry places looking for rest. Arizona. I know this is kind of dry here, isn't it? <laughs> okay, but it, we're not talking here. It goes to the dry places looking for rest and not finding any, it comes back and looks at his previous home, finds it swept, clean, empty, put in order. It knows it can't stay by itself, so it goes and gets seven worse, and they come back, so that the latter state is worse than the previous one. I think swept, clean, and order is good, but it doesn't need to be empty. We need to fill the house. How do you fill the house? Well, most people can fill their house up with just obeying Jesus, walking with Jesus, worship, the word, communion, with, with, and being in community with other believers. Most people can fill their lives up with Jesus. But if we have a thinking structure, a thinking stronghold that is in agreement with the enemy, then we need to be very specific in building a, in tearing down an ungodly stronghold and rebuilding a godly stronghold in the opposite spirit. You see, my, my grandpa had a dairy farm and uh, you train dairy cows pretty easily, okay? So, so these cows would, you know, would be out in the pasture. He'd milk them at night He'd go out to the pasture during the day and he'd, he'd go out there, honk his horn and they'd come in to get milked. Okay, you can train dairy cows to do that. They're, they're easily trained. And so he'd go out to the pasture, honk the horn, they'd come in. He went out on the same dirt road every time for I don't know how many years and wore deep, deep grooves on that road. In fact, those grooves were so deep he didn't even need to steer, just put the wheels in the grooves. I mean, if he had a cell phone, he could have texted, checked his email, but when a cow had a calf, that cow's not coming in, so he had to get out of the grooves, run across the pasture, grab the calf, put it in the back of the pickup, and that cow would go in. See, it's kind of like in our thinking structures, we have gone down those thinking structures so many times, we have grooves. It's our default thinking. And our default thinking is what feels true, even though it may not be true. We give our heart to Jesus. We're a new person, new creature. Now, now we have power to get out of the grooves. Now we've got to cut a new set of grooves. And the Bible says that we're transformed by the 
Renewing of the mind. What's a stronghold? Second Corinthians 10, three through five, for the weapons of our warfare, they're not carnal, they're not fleshly, they're divinely powerful to pull down strongholds, fortresses. And what does it goes on to say? We take every thought captive and make it obey Christ. A stronghold is a system of thinking that we've gone down that road of thinking so many times. That is our new normal. That is, I mean, that is our normal. That is our natural. To us. And that's what feels true because you see, I have a core belief system. What I believe becomes the thoughts that I think. What I think determines how I feel and how I feel determines what I do. You see, I can't change my feelings. When somebody said, well, don't feel that way, that, that, that doesn't ever work. I can't change my feelings, but I can change my thinking. If I change my thinking, that will change my feelings, and then that'll change what I do. So I'm, I'm supposed to be renewing our mind. So I have to sometimes be very specific and build a godly stronghold in the opposite spirit.